So I actually was, I was trying uh, to make uh, Kate say that my surname is Maurer, but even most people in German cannot pronounce that properly, <laughs> yet barely properly, so uh, we decided that I do a shot on that. But Wolfgang is so much easier and totally compatible with English. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, OSS community health, the theoretical aspects of it and the relation between practice and theory, and I've submitted this talk uh, with the comment that it's probably going to be an opinionated piece. <laughs> I think it will be an opinionated piece. I didn't say I'm, I'm submitting a rant. I guess that, that doesn't really work, but maybe in some sense it is, because um, I'm reflecting on my experiences that I did in both domains, uh, in, in academia, so doing, doing research, publishing papers, uh, crunching numbers, but also in, in practice, and that is, um, I'm um, yeah, I should, I should mention that I'm still active in both domains, so I work at the Technical University uh, of Applied Sciences in Regensburg. On a lot of uh, open source topics, I'll come to that later, and I'm still a member of uh, Siemens Corporate Technology, um, in particular the Open Source Competence Center Embedded Linux and Open Source. So, in a sense, I'm getting paid for working on open source, and I'm getting paid for working, uh, publishing papers about open source. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I did, and that's uh, maybe partly because every researcher, of course, is somewhat narcissistic, and every person from industry as well. But it's also important that you know what, what background I'm coming from and where my experiences are from, because this won't be a very scientific talk, but. Um, just reflecting on my experiences, yeah, you may, you may um, then call that uh, ethnography or whatnot. So I don't, I don't think it's, uh, it's very scientific, but still, I think it has maybe some value because I perceive now, after working for uh, more than a decade or 15 years in, in both communities, that there's still some kind of um, missing overlap that actually should be there. So the, the overlap should be there, and it could be there, but it's not. What did I do? What did I do at Siemens? So we mostly focus on building machines that are either scarily heavy or scarily large, or both, or just scary, like this uh, magnetic resonance tomograph. Actually, that's what we call an embedded system in the industry. Usually, you would think of an embedded system as a Raspberry Pi or um, as, a, as a Tegra or a Jetson or whatnot, that's an embedded system because it has one computer that's dedicated to one single purpose. That this one computer can have up to 96 CPUs, has 16 to 32 <coughs> hard drives on occasion, has uh, terabytes of memory, doesn't make it less embedded because you cannot carry it around. Uh, that is one example from the industrial control domain. That's actually a Cymatic TDC, so if, if you haven't heard that, that's basically the um, industry equivalent of COBOL. So we use nice languages like uh, structured text or statement list and um, you name it, that are about at the same or, or at the same amount of height of abstraction as COBOL is, that are about as old as COBOL is and that suffer from the same problems that COBOL has, so nobody's wants to learn it anymore, fewer and fewer people speak it, but still most of our civil infrastructure relies on such systems and most of our engineering, and uh, sorry, most of our production. Uh, that's another example from the healthcare domain, that's an x-ray detector, so uh, that's a component of many, many medical devices. Uh, that is a, a Siemens High Path. So these days it's, it's not a Siemens High Path anymore. It's what's the company called? It's not NSN. It's not Zen. It's uh, I forget. So um, Francis, you mm. don't know either. <laughs> so we, we sell companies. My mind, yeah. We sell companies too quickly, but still, that's that's <laughs> a <hit. laughs> that's a box where every um, where all your phone calls go through. And that's a uh, stack of money that's supposed to represent one problem that we've been working on lately, namely how to, to quantify the monetary value of software development, of inner source software development. In particular, to the most intricate problem that uh, can, be can, be, um, can be investigated when it comes to monetizing or calculating how much a software costs. Namely, uh, to explain it to tax advisors. I need them to explain it to the um, um, tax people how much tax you have to pay on the software you've produced. What's common among all these devices? I could have also listed, uh, shown a train here that didn't really fit well in terms of aspect ratio, is that it's all based on Linux. 
So all these devices run on Linux, and you can imagine that are not quite the standard uh, Ubuntu distribution that we can install on these systems. So we have very specific requirements here. We have a requirement that uh, medical image data need to be recorded. That is a very time sensitive process. So it's a very, the system has to satisfy very strong real time, um, um, has, to set, has to provide very strong real time guarantees. It also is a problem of <coughs> mass data processing. So you're recording gigabytes of data that then need to be um, processed with uh, image reconstruction algorithms that need to be visualized and so on in that all-in-one machine. That's a very, very challenging enterprise. So we need to interact very closely with many parts of the Linux community, basically going through the whole stack to adapt the system so that it satisfies our requirements. And you can also imagine that the requirements that we have in magnetic resonance tomographs are not always the same requirements that the Linux community has and the wider ecosystem of Linux has. Same thing for these uh, industrial control devices. You have real-time requirements. You also have safety requirements. So you will find ways of arguing that these devices really always do what they're supposed to do, not chop off an arm um, of yours in the manufacturing process, things like that. Uh, for medical devices, there's starting it later. And same thing, same thing for everything else. So. Uh, Coming, that means I'm, I've been quite a lot involved in the uh, Linux communities in various forms. So again, coming back to narcissism, uh, you can Photoshop everyone to look beautiful. Um, and uh, there's also, in particular, two open source projects um, that I want to mention in this talk. One is the Codeface project that you may know it's um, quite similar to what um, people do with uh, uh, the Vitalia tools that what they do in the KOSS project these days. It was an effort by Siemens started about yeah, nearly uh, 10 years from now to look at, look at uh, similar problems. And I will also be talking a lot about the civil infrastructure platforms. That's um, an effort that we do together with the Linux Foundation on actually providing an ecosystem of uh, components and operating system, user land software, update strategies, long-term maintenance strategies based on cooperation with existing open source communities uh, that will satisfy the needs of these civil infrastructure systems that uh, in contrast to the typical Android handy that um, the, assuming the willingness of Donald Trump gets updates for three months will need to be in operation for probably 20 years, 30 years or even longer. Yeah. So uh, I've, I've mentioned Codeface, and actually Codeface was um, started as an industrial project that we could use company internally to, yeah, let me see if I have the, the original slides here. So yeah, that's what we thought in 2014 or even earlier. So we wanted to find objective properties of successful projects. We wanted to quantify social factors to understand what components we should use and what not. We wanted to find most efficient approaches for a given scenario, assess ongoing development efforts, make informed choices, basically things that we've heard quite often today. Um, and in fact, it also resulted in, which is a, um, yeah, quite pleasant for me in my uh, academic role in a number of papers, so a couple of ICSI papers, uh, a couple of MC papers, ICSME papers, so I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. It didn't find any application within Siemens, which is kind of a pity, uh, but that's also part of the issues I'm going to talk about later. So it's very, uh, so, um, yeah, you can do academic research on these questions very well, but at they, they still don't seem to be, um, they seem, don't seem to quite fit with what industry actually needs, what industry actually expects, and what industry maybe should actually use, even if the research comes from within industry. Um, on the other hand, we've had, so that, um, we've had from the, from my um, industrial position, we've had, and partly also from the academic position, we've had a lot of talks, uh, Kate knows all these abbreviations, ELC, ELCE, OSSNA, OSSJ, OSSEU, that's all the Linux, the various Linux Foundation events, uh, they tend to rename them quite often to uh, confuse people. <laughs> Uh, well, here you see, so we, we did some, some quite deep technical work ranging from uh, shrinking Linux to systems that are way smaller than a magnetic resonance tomograph that um, 
even fit into your pocket are much smaller than a mobile phone even. But also um, cover these um, yeah, socio-technical aspects that everyone in, in research is so, is so interested about. And basically that was, that was the, um, the idea of bringing, bringing these two communities, working communities, research and industrial communities to an overlap. Um, so when I, or after, after I submitted that talk, and I promised in the talk so I would be discussing things from the industrial perspective and say what's, what's suboptimal, discuss it from the academic perspective and say what's suboptimal, I realized that actually this is a lose-lose situation for me because I can only annoy people <laughs> by telling them what they've done wrong and what they should done differently. Uh, so keep that in mind. It's uh, not that I'm a bad person, but I'm just discussing what I've experienced in the last um, decade or so, what goes wrong. But I made these very mistakes on both sides of the matter. So everything I'm complaining about is also something that I did do wrong and that I did do very well. Yeah, uh, so time, time to unsplit my, my split personality, my personality that's distributed across academia and um, and industry. Actually, also after, after submitting the thing and talking about unsplitting a split personality, I was thinking if I unsplit a split personality, wouldn't it merge again into one single person? Uh, that's food for thoughts uh, for the uh, native speakers, but you know, you know what I mean. If, uh, so I'm, I try to remember what I did during the last decade or so, think about the industrial systems I've been involved with, where we interacted quite a lot with the community, where we had to interact and work together with the community. And then I was thinking, so what would we have done differently? What could we have done better if we had, I mean, we have looked at the research that um, uh, was performed in these areas, and then I was asking myself, where did that research really make an impact? So where did it improve our life? Uh, what did we do better because of that research and where is actually where are results missing from research? Where did we encounter situations uh, that were not really really well addressed by research efforts? And so let me let me uh, discuss that by three examples. So the first one being Xenomai that relates to this. Uh, does anyone in the room know Xenomai perhaps? Okay. Siemens, Siemens Linux Foundation, okay. Uh, Xenomai is actually a, a co-kernel extension to the Linux kernel. I mentioned that this machine needs to satisfy um, very high throughput requirements, so you need to process lots of data within the shortest possible amount of time. That's the typical, um, typical task of a, um, a parallel system with a kernel like Linux. And it means if you process gigabytes of images, then some other task can be delayed to some extent, but with most tasks, that doesn't make a difference. Now, if you're recording medical image data on this machine, then it's the utmost importance that you say you send one magnetic pulse at this instance in time, and exactly 127.5 milliseconds later, you send another pulse, and then 57.5 milliseconds later, you send another pulse, and so on. And if you, if you miss these 57.5 milliseconds by, say, two milliseconds, which you wouldn't even notice when you do throughput processing, then your whole image is the whole image um, acquisition process is broken, you run into legal trouble because once you start uh, applying okay this machine doesn't apply radiation so it's it's less um, it's less of a danger. But you, you start into many troubles once you start um, to take a picture and then no picture emerges from your result. And this machine needs to satisfy these requirements simultaneously. That means we need to adapt the Linux kernel, which is a large kernel, millions of lines of code of very complicated, complicated code. Uh, sometimes, since the uh, colleague in the talk before mentioned it, even based on self-modifying assembler code, so that's not just something that COBOL can do, also the Linux kernel is very capable of um, playing such tricks. And we need to augment that with some, some real-time systems. That's what, what Xenomai does. Without getting into the detail how it does that, you need to modify the Linux kernel. You need to modify it very deeply. The Linux community doesn't like the Xenomai approach because they say, okay, it adds complexity to the kernel without giving any benefits to the 
99% or 99.9% of systems that are not necessarily a magnetic resonance tomograph and so they are really opposed to merging it upstream. So we need to, we need to on the one hand, keep this or um, um, maintain this project outside the Linux kernel, so we have, we're maintaining against a very quickly moving basis, which means uh, yeah, we need to we need to do these patch stacks in a way that very that can be very well forward ported, that can be very well tested, and so on, despite a um, rapidly moving basis. Uh, and we need to work with two communities: the Xenomai community and the Linux kernel community. Now, that would usually be the ideal situation to think about all these uh, community interaction results and uh, social results, how to handle people, and so on. But if you look at Xenomai which is the very foundation of these machines that we earn, or am I am allowed to say we earn a lot of money with them, <laughs> uh, that we, we don't necessarily make a loss selling them. Um, so it's, it's a very key component of these machines. And, but if you actually look at the community, then it turns out this effectively is a community maybe of five people, of whom two really are the... Um, are the most important ones, the key contributors. It's actually such a small community that now one of the Siemens engineers is the, say, two and a half or third member of this community, so we, we didn't have basically much choice than to extend this community by a third member. Now, if you think about the situation, we have one component that's maintained by a community of two people or maybe three people. You, we cannot replace this component, and we are these uh, two or three developer community versus the Linux kernel community with thousands of developers, yet somehow we need to juggle the situation. That's, uh, of course, a uh, very, very difficult scenario. The scenario that goes basically against all the advice that you see in uh, community papers, like don't use uh, unmaintained components. I guess every automatic approach would say Xenomai is an unmaintained component, is not a very active component. Uh, because it has only two people contributing to it, and so on, and so on, and so on, but still we need to solve that problem, and there's no, nothing really that we can take out of research, we cannot restructure our systems along uh, these guidelines, and so on, we just need to live with it somehow. Same thing goes for the uh, civil infrastructure platform project that I mentioned, we need to maintain a Linux kernel here for 20 years, that means we need to backport lots of stuff. That's a, a known, uh, that's a very well-researched uh, topic in, um, uh, in community and ecosystem analysis, how you should do backporting, that you shouldn't rely on packages that are, again, unmaintained and so on, that you should um, judge the qualities of communities to see which component you can use in a, or should use in a deployment that's supposed to last for a long time. But actually, these considerations all break down if you're bound to maintain a thing for 20 years. Because every component, or almost every component, will be unmaintained in 20 years. Uh, because s people simply lose interest, yes. Uh, and um, for, for most deployments, it's not necessarily, and it's not necessary to maintain uh, them for such a long time. Because if, again, if you think of mobile phones, and even if you use these for a long time, it's maybe four years or so, which is nothing. So 20 years. Maintenance, and again, not very many results really apply to this uh, scenario. All the patch selection results, all the automated backporting results, all the advice on how to structure your systems to enable backporting well, really don't work for us. Um, yeah, since it's only eight minutes, and actually I wanted, I wanted to uh, let you do most of the talking, so just bring up some, <laughs> some problems that I see and then let uh, hear your opinion on them. Is the uh, JLAS would be the same result. So what we are seeing in all these uh, and many of the other examples that I've, I've shown in the beginning is that the problems that we're having with the socio-technical interactions are not really because one large community interacts with another large community or we need to find optimal ways of structuring our community and things like that. It's more like this situation from uh, my name is nobody when a Jack Beauregard uh, is going to fight against the 150 people from the, I think it, the Wild Bunch, so you've seen this film, and I'm, I'm not advocating that uh, developers shoot developers, and I'm not advocating physical violence, and so just, just to make sure, what I'm saying with this picture is that in 
yeah, well, in the Wild West, obviously, there are often situations when one person needs to fight against 150, but that's something you see in software development too. So you have the success of your projects rely on one or two or three persons on a very small set of engineers, but you see that pattern very frequently, especially when it comes to these very fundamental systems. And this is a point then where all the, all the research results, all these nice results that we have about how to interact, how to be nice to people, how to, how to detect sub-communities, how to detect responsible people's, people, and so on, completely break down. Yet, it's the type of problem that we need to solve. And um, yeah, that, that's, that, that's the part now where I'm uh, going to make enemies or <laughs> Um, that has the potential of making enemies. So I want uh, I wanted to make you understand why we're feeling this pain and why what's in the literature is at the moment lacking um, many of the knowledge that we would actually need. So I've taken some papers. I've taken I'm, I'm deliberately not showing the authors because that that's not the point. The point is uh, when you look at the advice that's given to you in these socio-technical and community health papers, you see things like that. So when you talk about communication, you have results like, okay, you send an email and people whom you address the email to or who you see are more likely to reply, which I absolutely don't doubt. And the people who commit in the same areas of source code are more likely to reply. That I also completely don't doubt. The question is just, what do we learn as an industry from that? Is there anything actionable that we can take out? And that's where the heart begins. Same thing, if you if you uh, look into the community papers on, say, the benefits of upstreaming, then you find things like, okay, you should upstream because it reduces your overhead. That's pretty clear, and that's a clear advantage, but then the second argument is it brings benefits to the community. Now, assume you work at a large corporation that's supposed to make money, and then you tell them, okay, you need to commit um, upstream, you need to open source your code because it gives benefits to the community. That's uh, maybe a hard argument to make, and yeah, even if you tell your managers that's the right thing to do, I'm completely convinced it's the right thing to do, but if I say we need to do it because it's the right thing to do, that won't have very much success. Same thing with uh, analysis. There's lots of analysis that investigate how we should optimize patches so that they are going to be accepted fast, um, or that we, can, that we can estimate how long it will take until a patch with certain criteria is going to be accepted upstream. In the Xenomai example, so what we did a number of years ago is we changed from a development model where we just took what's in the open source community and then uh, installed that on our machines and did the testing and arrived at the um, uh, saw bugs and then fixed Xenomai and so on. At some point we switched to a upstream first process that was very successful by the way. So Whatever we wanted to put into a product is we put upstream first, we heard the arguments of the community, we heard the concerns, uh, and then what came out were very much improved patches, but the thing that we didn't care in the least about is does this process take a week, or does it take two days, or does it take two months? It takes how long it takes, because we are interested in getting the optimum result and not predicting um, how long the upstream merging will take, because if we can find a way to merge everything within one week and have the same bugs as before, nobody benefits. Maintenance, so these, uh, these 20, 20 year systems, uh, 20 year maintenance <coughs> interval systems that I've mentioned, what you find in the literature is things like, um, yeah, do not depend on unmaintained packages, which is completely reasonable if you're uh, building a new system, if your package is already unmaintained back then, then don't use it, but many of the times, you technically don't have any alternatives then to use effectively unmaintained packages like the uh, Xenomai approach. Or maybe even you can go to the extreme and say the preempt approach is also kind of effectively unmaintained because there's maybe Thomas Gleichsner and three people in the world who understand it and that by all going most... upstream. Pardon? It's all going upstream. Well, the, uh, what they are telling since yes. how many years? <laughs> <laughs> when, yeah. when cold fusion is established, it's all, be, it's all going to be uh, upstream. Well, <laughs> But yeah, you, well, you well, know, I, I, mean, I know this relates, so we, we, we will divert this one so dinner. Yeah, that, that, that's a topic for dinner. The thing is, I'm going to take the question in a second. The thing is, um, yeah, we'd really like to do that, but most of the time we just can't because there's technical pressure. And the same thing is uh, when, when the papers tell us to use security monitoring tools, we would love to do that. We would love to have these tools that tell us where security <laughs> problems are, but they're just not here. Uh, so you had a question? 
Yeah, so I'm not sure the, uh, what the situation is with this particular thing, but in general when you don't want to depend on unmaintained package, but you don't have any alternative, what you do is you become the maintainer of that package. Mm -hmm. Which is effectively... It, it, it's, a, it's a different problem, but it is, it is a, a valuable and uh, viable way to, uh, out of this. You just accept your fate and say, well, from now on, this is my project. Yeah. I Without going into any details of this, the main points that I see are also already mentioned in the keynote this very morning, and that is basically the, the statement that all the other questions derive from, connecting the results of the model, models with the impact of things is necessary. I really like this um, statement that Jesus made um, this morning, because that is the main thing that we are currently lacking in, um, in ecosystems research, research and in, in open source community research. And, um, in general, so we can measure lots of things, we can measure interesting things, we can produce tremendous amounts of numbers based on tremendous amounts of projects, but for industry it's still extremely hard to connect all these results to concretely measurable improvements to uh, specific guidance in how we should how we should act in future projects. And um, that's not just something that Daga Kekinia should do, that's also something that industry really still has something, some, some, uh, some, some things to catch up. We're not interacting optimally with, uh, with academia because it's clear academia is good at producing numbers, but to, to some extent they cannot know um, what we're using the codes for, what our problems are, and so on. And we could do much better in providing guidance what to actually measure despite our first, first attempts in KOSS to interpret this number, to help science quantify things, and to make these, all these objections all happen. Objections, all these, these interesting observations that science provides us with, make them objective, make them useful, justify them, and things like that. Yeah, and again, so here's a, a list of, a list of um, open topics that I'm not going to discuss that, that also basically relate to the uh, statement by Jesus this morning. Uh, you will get the slides, and that's again, I guess, is um, material for 20 papers that I hope will, will be written in the future by these, uh, by these efforts that we're having now that are a very good basis um, to arrive at the community interaction, at the industry academia interaction that I would like to have, but that is um, still quite a good way to go. Good. Thanks. So you see my, my plan uh, on uh, just just throwing in some points and then letting you do all the talking spectacular <laughs> fail. But, but I have a flower and I hope I didn't make too many enemies. <laughs> That's already a uh, part of the goal, so thank you. Thank you.